Subaru. They're known for their fantastic all-wheel drive systems. Honda, on the other hand, not so much. But how much of a difference is there really? Well, during the last snowstorm, I took both my all-wheel drive vehicles, a 2014 Subaru Impreza and a 2003 Honda Element to its snow-filled parking lot to find out. Now, this isn't a test of which is the better winter car, because they're both on very different tires. The Subaru is on General Ultimax RT43 all-season tires, with plenty of tread left, and the Element's on Goodyear Wrangler GSAs, which are a bit old and dry rotted, but also have plenty of tread left. So strictly based on tires, the Element is the better vehicle, and also has a few more inches of ground clearance, which helped it, you know, not get bogged down. Not that I really have an issue with that in the Subaru anyway. This is just simply a test to see how the all-wheel drive systems react to slipping. Well, let's get into it. The test was very simple. I revved the car to about 2500 RPM in first gear, then dumped the clutch. The goal was to get enough wheel spin to, as to not bog down the car and see how the all-wheel drive system reacts to all the slippage. So let's start with the Element. And you can see right away that the Element's front tires spin and the rears don't do anything. There's quite a large speed differential between front and rear axles and it takes a bit of time for the rear wheels to kick in. This is pretty noticeable in normal driving too, where it's really not that difficult to chirp the front wheels on the supposed real-time four-wheel drive car, even on asphalt. You can see how much the fronts are spinning right now and the rears really aren't doing anything. Eventually though, the car does react and both axles start to spin at the same rate. Let's do another run. This time around, the rears react much more quickly. And I have a theory as to why, which I'll explain in a minute. Honda really makes no attempts to hide the fact that this is a front bias all-wheel drive system that can send up to 50% of the power to the rear axle. It's also worth noting that there's no traction control or any sort of electronic aids on this model, as this is a 2003 and that started becoming standard in the 2007 model year. Both front and rear axles are also open differentials, and there is no way to lock the center differential manually. All right, now let's try the Subaru. And you can immediately tell the difference. You can see both axles spin at the same rate right away. And this is because of the way Subaru sets up its all-wheel drive system, specifically on the manual transmission vehicles. Subaru's system is known as symmetrical all-wheel drive and is known for always sending power to all four wheels, no matter what the situation is. While this is true, not all Subaru systems are created equal and I'll link an engineering explain video describing the differences between them. The manual transmission vehicles, except for the STI, have a constant 50-50 front rear torque split under all conditions. So there's no waiting for the rears to kick in because there's always power going to them. Well, let's do another run. And you can see the same thing happens this time. And there's even enough power going to the rears right away to make it oversteer a little. Now, this is a massive difference compared to the Element. It's also more consistent. It's worth noting that I have pulled the fuse so there is no traction or stability control on, just like the Element. And both axles, front and rear, are open. And there's no way to lock the center differential, also just like the Element. So it shows there is a clear, distinct mechanical advantage to Subaru's all-wheel drive system, especially compared to Honda's. Now, for this next run, I'm going to turn traction and stability control on. And this will allow the ECU to individually apply the brakes to wheels that are spinning faster relative to other wheels. In theory, this will give you more traction because of the way friction works. You see, the point of maximum traction is the point right before the wheel starts slipping. This point is known as static friction. And that's what the computer is trying to achieve. Because once the wheel starts slipping and spinning, there's less maximum traction available. That's known as kinetic friction. Take a look at this handy graph here, or here, not sure yet, to see what I'm talking about. Good. So off I go in the run with traction control on. Now in this slow-mo, you can see the computer braking the wheels in hopes to get closest to the point of maximum friction. You can see them spinning quickly and they're slowing down, then speeding up again, slowing down again. That's the computer applying the brakes and then unapplying them and then reapplying them and you know, so on and so forth. It's the same concept as analog brakes, except in reverse. Now, the only problem with this is that it also cuts power from the engine. 
So although you may have more traction, you may not actually be any quicker. This also causes the engine to bog down quite a bit, especially in slow two liter terms. And that really reduces the responsiveness of the engine. There are some cases in which traction control is more helpful, but this really is not one of those. So I usually just keep it off and because it's really more annoyingly intrusive than it is helpful, in my opinion. So what's the engineering difference between Honda's and Subaru system? Well, I'm glad you asked, because I don't know. Just kidding. I have, I have a pretty good idea. Let's start with the Honda element. As far as I can tell, it doesn't matter if you have a manual or an automatic element, the system is the same. The car is normally front wheel drive. When the front wheels start to slip, it sends power to the rear through a multiplay clutch on the side of the differential. Now, important to note, this is not the same clutch that you press down when shifting gears. Completely different clutch. But a clutch is actually a very widely used method of power transfer based pretty much by rotational friction, not just in cars with a third pedal. But how does the car know when the front wheels are slipping? Because like I said before, there's no traction control on this car. Well, it uses this uh, pretty interesting pump system. So basically the front and rear axles are each driving their own pump right there. And when all four wheels are going at the same rate, AKA no wheels are slipping, the pumps are being driven at the same rate. And there's no difference in pressure between the front and rear pumps. And a pressure differential is really what's gonna cause this clutch to engage. So when say the front wheel starts slipping, it's gonna drive this pump faster and there's gonna be a difference in pressure between the front and the rear pumps. Now this opens this little valve body right here and that'll cause the clutch to engage and that'll connect the front and rear axles together through that center differential there. And once both the front and rears are spinning at the same rate again, there's no pressure difference in the system. The valve closes, the clutch disengages and power goes just back to the front wheels. Earlier I mentioned during the second run that the rear wheels engaged much more quickly that time. I have a theory as to why. I assume that there was already a bit of pressure within the system and so the pressure differential is far less than what would normally be what was in the first run. So it took a lot less time for the rear wheels to engage. That's my theory there. The Subaru, on the other hand, uses a much more proactive system. And like I said before, it actually varies based on the car or the transmission the car has as to what system the Subaru actually uses. You can check out Engineering Explains video, but because mine is a manual car, I'm going to be focusing on, well, the manual transmission system. Now in this guise, it splits the torque 50-50 front rear under normal conditions. It's connected via a center differential with a viscous coupling on it that will activate when it starts its wheel slippage. And this will allow up to 80% of the engine's power to be sent to either the front or the rear axle. So pretty much 30% more than normal conditions, give or take. So the viscous coupling itself, it's an all mechanical system. You can take off the traction control and stability control and well, obviously it still works. It's a case that sits right here on the center differential and allows the front and rear to spin at different rates. The coupling is also filled with a fluid, a viscous fluid actually, hence the term viscous coupling. And in this case, the fluid is silicone. Also within this coupling, you have a bunch of different plates with slots and holes in each of them. Some are connected to the front axle, like the blue ones, and some are connected to the rear axles, like the red ones. And they are staggered in between, you know, front, rear, front, rear, and they're kind of all smushed together, but not always touching. And you see what happens is when one axle starts spinning faster than the other, their associated clutches are going to spin faster and they're going to spin faster in that fluid. And that's going to cause the fluid to heat up. And when the fluid heats up, it's going to get more viscous. It's going to get more thick. And when it gets more viscous, when it gets more thick, it increases the shear forces acting on the clutches that aren't spinning as fast. So for example, say the fronts are spinning faster than the rears. So the front wheels are slipping. The blue clutches are gonna be spinning faster than the red ones. And so those faster spinning blue clutches is gonna thicken up the fluid. And that thick fluid is gonna allow more force to be applied to the rears, which aren't spinning as fast. And this effectively is, is joining together the front and rear axles until they spin at the same speed again. Because when they both spin at the same speed, they're not gonna be driving the fluid as hard. And it's gonna 
if they're not a little bit. And also if you have traction control on, it will individually apply brakes to the wheel that is spinning faster relative to the other wheels. So while both systems require wheel slippage to actually transfer torque, Subaru defaults even power to both the front and the rear axles, meaning that there is immediately more traction from the get-go. This can be seen in this lovely drift, because not only does the Subaru rotate more than the Element, because the rear wheels are being driven with more torque, it actually throws snow up and over the vehicle. You give the Subaru a bunch of gas, and it will easily rotate around. But in the Element, you have to time it more for it to happen. It's not nearly as instantaneous like the Subaru. This also means on the road, the Subaru is just more responsive and more traction to car to drive. And although the Element has better tires, I have way more confidence in control driving the Subaru in the snow. So what does this all mean? Well, it means the hype behind Subaru's all-wheel drive system is true, especially compared to Honda's. Now, I know these cars are a little bit outdated and Honda has improved the all-wheel drive system since 2003, but these are the cars I have access to and these are the results of my somewhat unscientific test. Hopefully, I'll be able to try this out with an automatic impressor soon to see if there's a discernible difference between Subaru's all-wheel drive systems. But for now, let me know what you think below. What would you like to see from this test that I didn't include? What other cars do you want me to test? If I, you know, could get access to them. Leave a comment below, but until then, I'll see you next video.